This holiday message was originally recorded during the winter solstice 2020 and is a preview of the Bob Thurman podcast. To learn more about the Bob Thurman podcast, please visit his website at bobthurman.com. Greetings, everyone, my podcast friends. It's been a long time but due to COVID and due to being preoccupied with other online activities, but I haven't really done sort of podcasts where I'm giving any commentary myself. And I've been very, very remiss in that I have a number of writers and creative people who really wanted to um, do a podcast with me because you know you can't do book tours nowadays and so forth. So they wanted people to know about their trip and I want them to know about their, their brave voyages on earth. And so I'm gonna start doing a series of more frequent podcasts, I, I hope. But anyway, now I've been, and therefore I've been restricting my own commentaries about political matters uh, to personal conversations in the last many months. And um, my engineer, uh, Justin Stone Diaz, has been unable, we haven't been able to sort of communicate frequently. I also didn't do my general series on the Avatamsika Sutra that I wanted to do, which would probably be something like 21 sessions or possibly 37 sessions. It's such a huge ocean. If you figure that I did 12 sessions on the Vimalakirti, which in English translation is 108 uh, pages. Then the Avatamsaka from the Chinese version uh, by Thomas Cleary, the, my dear friend, Thomas Cleary's translation was 1600 pages. <laughs> if you multiply it 108 by 15 times, 12 by 15, 12 times 15 is what? Uh, what is 12 by 15? 12 by 12 would be 244, I think. So then three more 12s, 36 on that would be 50, 80, 280. So I would have to do, if I would be a comparable level of fine detail for the Avatamsaka in English, for an English speaking audience, it would be 280 one hour sessions. Are you ready, Justin? Yeah. Are you ready for that? <laughs> I don't think anybody's ready for that. But, uh, and I buy my croak, I think I'll be croaking or taking rebirth before I would finish. But, uh, uh, you know, dying and taking rebirth out of my nearly 80 year old embodiment. But um, maybe I'll do 30, 21. I'll try to do 21 or 30. I, I will try to figure out how you, I could fit in. Because you know, the, the amazing thing about the Avatamsaka is that it has, you know, 52 Bodhisattva stages to get to Buddhahood. You know, usually we hear about the 10 Bodhisattva sages and then Tantra adds two or three on top of that. So you get to the 13th or 14th stages, full Buddhahood in the Mahasiddha Tantric thing. And, uh, and yet the Avatamsaka Sutra gives, 30, gives uh, 52 stages. It tracks 52 of which the 10 Bodhisattva sages are 41 to, or 40 to 49. And uh, no, 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 31, I'm sorry, to 40. That's what it's 31 to 40. And then, or 30 to 39, I, I'm not certain actually. I'll have to <laughs> look that up. But then there's these amazing 10 stages of 10 goddess teachings from 41 to 50. And then Manjushri and Maitreya's 51, 52. Because each of the stages is connected to a particular teaching in the last third of the Avatamsaka. So it's something that, and actually the Tibetans didn't really pick up on those 52 stages in the same way. The Chinese particularly elaborated them because they developed a whole school based on the flower ornament. Uh, in a way, it was a kind of almost their replacement of Tantra, of the Tibetan and late Indian focus on Tantra was the way the Chinese did it. So it's really interesting. We'll, we'll come to that in the future. What we want to talk about today, I want to talk about our beloved Joe and Kamala, and also AOC and Rashida and all of her squad and some of the new ones like Jamal Bowman and so forth, the more, the more you know, strong progressives 
in the Democratic Party. And possibly we may find there will be a few strong progressives as the, re, the reshuffling of the Republican Party takes place when the sort of Trump fanatics, you know, continue with whatever he offers them, which is basically joining the Confederacy, <laughs> rejoining the Confederacy, the Nazi Party, and the KGB oligarchy three of the major enemies of America, rejoining them. He's offering, that's what he offers to them. So they're not going to really be the Republican Party any longer, I think. Or if they take over the name and the other Republicans can't resist, then there will be another party, which would be a cons true conservative party, which we need, which will seek to conserve nature and conserve the planet and conserve the American exceptionalism and conserve American idealism. And that would be, you know, against anybody who has the extreme thing that America was always no good, completely, 100%, just bad. You know? And there's a kind of super left conspiracy that, you know, a group that considered the populist kind of group that can think that. And after all, they have the very much a point America was founded in genocide, and then it prospered in slavery, and then it had a brief attempt to fulfill the all humans, at least are created equal, although it didn't even include animals at that time. And then that was shut down with, you know, robber barons, and then, you know, colonial, a new kind of sort of secondary British colonialism imperialism. And so, you know, you could say it's been just bad from the beginning. But then that relates to an idea that everybody is bad from the beginning. There's that may relate to some sort of, you know, romanticization of primitive tribalism that they were all good from the beginning. You know, but that's simplistic, I'm afraid. And uh, there's very much good things about indigenous traditions in their connection to nature, but then they were very usually very much in, in you know struggling with each other, especially whenever the a local environment would become stressed climatically and so on. And of course, they ate animals and you know etc. So the point is, something completely new and different for the human beings is what we need. You know, not going back all the way, not going front. And that is there in little tiny golden thread in the American idealist constitutional founding or more the Declaration of Independence, rebellion against empire and uh, Jeffersonian kind of sign of trying to liberate his own slaves into, you know, three times into the Virginia legislature to be emancipation, you know, laws he tried to build, he tried to put through to be defeated. And then he did somehow try to emancipate his own slaves eventually and so on. And his will and uh, his family didn't follow through, of course, but they may yet still. And that is there, you know, in, in America. And that is the thread that America offers to the planet. You know, uh, democracy, true democracy, real democracy. You know, people think, oh, Athens, they defend democracy in Athens. No, they tried it briefly, but mostly they had dictators in, in Athens, actually. They only had real democracy to defeat the Persians because democracy makes you, gives everyone a stake in defending the society and spreads that stake. So it makes you stronger, actually, although less bellicose and less imperialist but stronger ultimately, to, at least in self-defense, at least temporarily. And hopefully, and we need to see in America that it's ultimately, it does become the lifestyle conquest, the Dharma conquest of the world. That's what we need. We need to go back to the Emperor Ashoka, to his edicts in India, which was the wealthiest of ancient Eurasian societies. And where he, he foreswore military, physical conquest of others. And he said, the only conquest worth anything is 
truth conquest, what you, if you translate Dharma as truth conquest, or even more radically, you could translate it as reality conquest. That is to say, people are conquered by facing the reality that the best way to live is when you're in control and have conquered your own inner delusion, greed, hatred, anger, jealousy, pride, you know, when you are a happy person from within and blissful, you feel the bliss of life from within and therefore you can be, you can share that with others and you will naturally be loved by them and you will generate a nude of loving community within your area once you are like that. And that's the, and the, so that's Dharma, that's education conquest, you could say, which leads to democracy conquest which can only be done, democracy cannot be imposed by force. It's only where people decide that's the way to go, that's the way to live. Where kings automatically divest themselves, oligarchs automatically decide to be one of the people, to be connected to others, and to maintain wealth in a, within a moderate, moderate scope, let's say, so that it relates to no one being deeply deprived no slavery of any of any direct or indirect kind. So that's what we're shooting for. And that's what there's always been a tendency to shoot for in America. And that's why American like entertainment, for example, you know, we America created jazz, you know, the, the downtrodden people in America created jazz. Michael Jackson, you know, you know, dances and, and rock and roll and things. You know, we helped create, the British helped, but but only once they got past abolition and so on, and through by connecting to their American, the Beatles are singing their songs without a British accent. <laughs> so they're becoming sort of, you know, honorary Americans, you know, Rolling Stone too. Can't get no satisfaction, not done with a British accent. And that's the reason for our creativity in America. that we have this idea of equality. We try to embed in our constitution, in our founding documents, in our checks and balances, the idea of the equality of all humans and all races and all genders and all gender orientations. And there's that thread. And elsewhere in the world, not so, so much. Although the European Union has, has that thread coming in from that thread creeping through, you know, our conquest, you know, our, you know, our, so it, creeping through us was that sort of European idea of an imperial conquest and you know, through economic means, let's call it. But creeping through them was our idea of equality and no need for tribal fighting between Czechs and Poles and Slavs and, Serbians and Croats and whoever it is, you know, that that's still there in, in so much in that area. And India has it, because they always had it because it was a big melting pot. China is not learning it. They are kind of doing a kind of Marxist, Marxist you know, imperialism themselves, sort of Marxist tinged imperialism. And um, and that's what's precious in America. And that's what we must create. And by in Joe Biden, we strategically moved with Joe Biden, cued by the people under deepest oppression among us, the blacks and Native Americans. And uh, so, but his thing is a return to normalcy. But normalcy though is where that golden thread is suppressed under a red thread of white tribalism, which which is not good seen, which has been there since since uh, you know Reconstruction got buried within a few presidencies, even with the assassination of Lincoln almost immediately by Andrew Johnson. So the emancipation of the forty acres and a mule didn't really properly happen, for which we need to make radical reparations. So, so therefore, the, we need to be practical and moderate in the steps, but we need to be radical 
in the direction, definitely. But we need to do it in strategically clever ways. And there's a few ideas that are not even on the table that should be on the table. And I, I think of myself, it's my fantasy, and forgive me, any of you who are really frontline people, I don't pretend to know what to do. I really don't. And my ideas are all simplistic ivory tower type of ideas. I, and it's one way I, I think of myself as a sort of lost nomad from Central Asia. <laughs> well, I need a yak and a horse and a tent, you know. And uh, I don't know about governing big city states, you know. But I don't glamorize that kind of idea. Do we need we need city states? We need to deal with them. They need to realize there's sort of there's an essential nomadism in life. And we need to extend our sense of sensitivity and sentiency to animals, not only to other genders and other tribes among the humans, but even we have to understand the animals have their own tribes, they have their own soul bearing beings, and we have to extend to them. So they will, they will go back to defending us against the viruses, the micro animals that are currently have laid low our sort of world tech, techno, humanoid, human triumphalist civilization, so-called civilization. Well, these are in America, instead of, you know, the, the people overall with their, of course, with the fact that America is horribly in debt, we have to realize, but, but that, that doesn't matter. We can print money, so we should spend it lavishly to get ourselves on the right track. And, but, but one thing, sort of real reparation, radical, instantaneous, would be something like $3 trillion or $5 trillion or $10 trillion given to all minorities immediately. And, uh, and that would, people would freak out, the other people, the whiteies would just go berserk over that and they would really secede and they would just be, you know, we would become so defenseless, there would be so much inner stress that we, who knows which oligarchs would show up with which militaries or which, you know, cyber strikes and everything be making us defenseless and so on. So that wouldn't work. But it's very simple. Oh, let's take 30 billion, take $30 billion and create lobbying institution associated with the Museum of Black History on the mall in Washington. We create a, a big lobbying institution with a $40 billion capital budget, let's say 50 billion, say 50 billion, 50 billion is a pittance, it's like one fleet, you know, $50 billion capital budget where they, 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 they can match corporate lobbyists dealing with every single bill on every single topic, on energy production, on food production, on urban design, on communication, transport, whatever it is, they can lobby. Whether or not, you know, the sort of liberal democratic cabinet survives past two years of its first thing, we're not even starting unless we win the Georgia things, we won't even start with having the three branches of government, we have a very conservative Supreme Court. We have no good, we have a Republican controlled, very thinly controlled Senate, we have a slim majority in the House. And uh, so we don't have a big way of starting anything radical. Things have been so broken, not by just by Trump alone, he just was capstone breaker, started from Goldwater actually, you know, and then really in power with Reagan and then Goldwater, Nixon, Reagan, you know, so it's been going on for, since, since we became triumphal military industrial complex at the end of World War II, but really accelerating the last 40 years. Oil industry polluting madly and, and really destroying the planet. But at least we had a major lobbying. Then another 50 billion to the native people connected to the Native American Museum. But as a real active activist organization with funds and, and, high, and lawyers and people who write you know, laws and who can counter write bills and you know, fine print and can read fine print in bills. 
about the food system and the energy system and you know the Native American sensibility about taking care of the environment is absolutely necessary. And the black sensibility about not oppressing, you know, immigrants and blacks and and um, and themselves, you know, and creating new methods and and you know emptying the prisons. No more private industry in prison. Lobbying against private prison industries, and really replacing them with educational industries and lobbying for in education bills to make sure that every community, every ghetto, every, and, and then undoing ghettos with urban planning and whatever you want to. And restoring organic farming, more soil scale human input and bringing, helping people come out of slums and things into developing good villages and solid villages in the countryside and learning how to do that. You know, and getting over fossil fuel based chemical farming, which is so destructive to the atmosphere, to the soil, to the water. And maybe a lobbying institute for all the animal defense, you know, ASPCA, maybe to, to animals, giving them lobbying about force and power and, and, the, and the, the forests. You know, and nature lobbying power. So take uh, 200 billion and divide it. If those are four institutions that would be a presence, whatever the administration, constant presence in Washington <clears throat> in making sure that we keep going in the right direction, no matter whether for, and, and working on developing the conservatives in the right direction and completely stopping all subsidy, moving all subsidy into, into natural, you know, renewable fuels and renewable energy production and, renew and, and organic agricultural production and cleaning also all polluted things massively. That's what we need. And once we do that, then all of the, and then there will be environmental justice, there'll be, you know, urban, you know, design justice, and it will be, it will be institutional. The golden thread will be not just a thread, it'll be part of the institutional weave. That's what we need to do, that sort of thing. It's that level of radical. And we need to back away from trying to police the whole world. Although we really also need to, in a way, on the other hand, we do need to be seen once we have gotten our own society in better order, we need to be willing to defend this kind of movement in other cultures. If we need a foreign policy like Carter's, you know, that defends human rights. And uh, you know, the Obama administration was not strong enough in that, and the Car and the and the Clinton administration was not strong enough about that because they were both infected by the polluters and by the corporate power. And we really need to bring government into cooperation with corporation in a different way, where the corporations have to do their share. I believe there's a global, there is a global statistic that 35% some, or maybe 80% 80, 80 of global income goes through corporations and only 20% through governments. And that's really wrong. You know, that's, that will inevitably lead to fascism in different countries because corporations will become where they will see through it that laws and governments, whatever tax revenue and tax things there are, they will be put to use just, they'll also just be, you know, accessories of the corporations. And then when the smaller people, smaller groups will be defenseless against legislation for oligarchy, oligarchy will take over as it is currently threatening to do with great, you know, it's, it's easy to be depressed and pessimistic about our future because of that. But we must not cave into that. We must not give into that. Nature is on our side.
So I've been just wanting to put those ideas forward that nobody has thought of as a reparational thing by not just dishing out cash, although that's good, but, but creating a long-term force within the whole lobbying bribery oriented government that would be able to go toe to toe with corporate lobbying. Because that's how corporations run the government. They write the laws. Their, their lobbyists are better funded. They have more higher salaries than the congressmen and women, than the, than the legislators. So, and they have a better staff and better computers and better support. So they write the laws and they come in with them all pre-written and they just hand them over. And then they, they control the, the election funding things. And then of course the, the election, the, the stupid Citizens United level of unlimited corporate funding and the wrong considering of corporations as individual human beings with, with free speech rights completely makes the congressperson vulnerable to the corporate control because they can't run for office without being funded by them. And they give them some little tips, 100,000 here, 100,000 there. Well they, well, they write laws that make them billions, these corporations. So we have to recognize that fascism is already kind of here. And then, but then within that structure, give the downtrodden people, the downtrodden environment, the downtrodden nature, the downtrodden human beings. We give them the means to defend themselves within this sort of lobbying bribery thing. And, we, and once, we've rec once we've repaired the courts and the funding of elections and uh, just put billions into funding elections ourselves from the government, not from the corporation, and then putting the corporations back into being, facing their licensing things, which are the states, about whether they're damaging the environment, the commonwealths of the different states. States' rights against corporations, not against minorities, you know, but within the system, then that way we can, we can have, we can get the golden thread to be the golden mainstream for all the beings in the nation. And then happiness will be there in the nation again. And then our happiness will be irreducibly seductive and attractive to everyone on the planet. And the, the oligarchies and the tyrannies, the dictatorships will themselves want to participate. And the oligarchs will want to be interconnected again to the people and they will voluntarily help in the process. This is the vision, rather, we don't want any violent revolutions against any violent oligarchs, because that'll just produce more violent oligarchs. The winners of that violence will be more violent. So we don't want that. We want the wealthy to participate and support and realizing that they have the great power of generosity and the great divine karma of generosity. That's what we want. I know this is very unorganized because I wasn't really planning this. I was just doing a holiday thing. But, uh, but that's what I have to say about it. That's how we have to proceed. And so AOC, people of the AOC team, they should be in the cabinet, for example, now. They should not be where they just sort of yeah, from outside having to worry about some sort of elder generation within the Democrats trying to be normal. Because normal for the Democrats for the last 40 years has been being Republican light. And the, and the senior Democrats have to admit that. They really do. Reaching across the aisle, come on, Jill. You have to be political. Political means you have to be a healthy opponent across the aisle. You have to oppose what the people, the oligarch funded people on the other side are doing. You can't get oligarchs to back you to oppose oligarchs. You have to have the people there for you 
So there should be a special, and if there's no position that is the right one, it should be a minority representative in the cabinet, let's say, let's say, or progressive, rep 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 you know, representing progressivism in the debates in the cabinet. What would that be called? That would be a new position. And, you know, AOC or anybody in her team or, you know, who is who they feel really represents them should be there in the executive in that way. There's no doubt. All of, you know, under the, the truth, you know, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, these folks, you have Kamala as the vice president, if she's a really activist one, good. And that one she, you did remove from the Senate, and, but that's in a good, fairly democratic state where the governor will appoint a Democrat so you didn't lose a seat there. Okay, great. You couldn't put Bernie because Vermont has a Republican governor. You couldn't put Elizabeth because Massachusetts has a Republican governor. I see that. But AOC is not going to lose the, you know, for example, AOC herself, I think, should be in the cabinet. Some do a radical thing like that. You can do as an, in a new position, speaking for minorities. And she's a Latin, Latinx. And then I, th I think there really should be one serious black member who's just there speaking for the blacks. It's not there to do HUD, not there to do this, that. You have a Native American for the interior. That is deeply tremendous, wonderful. But how about a Native American speaking for the Native Americans in all directions? So that would be three new cabinet positions to bring to bear their sensibility. You, you, you know, the fact that you have blacks and immigrants and people doing that, but then they're supposed to be doing something that basically their full energy is in the interior or in EPA or in housing and urban development and so forth, and not someone checking them from a progressive point of view as only there to just represent the interests of the progressive. That would be a first start. And then you'd create three big lobbying institutions behind them to make sure that continues if you lose your lose the House, lose the Senate, you know, what could happen to you if you just try to be normal. Right now, the Republicans are doing everything possible to constrain your ability to do a big green revolution, to do a big infrastructure project, to, you know, oh, they're worrying about the deficit again after all their tax cuts and crap. Nonsense, you have to oppose that. So three members of your cabinet will help you because they'll make sure that you don't get lulled into thinking we're doing important things because we're the executive, like Obama was, like Clinton was, both in 93 and 209. They had very strong progressive agendas in mind and they were crushed down. And then they lost the, they lost the Congress because they, they successfully blamed them for not getting everything done because the, the education system has not educated the masses to understand that they can cripple an executive if the oligarch backed House and Senate to flood the media with blame of the executive for the failures and the lack of fulfillment of promises. And they definitely do that to you in 2022. It'll be definitely a bad year if you're not more radically progressive. On all fronts, not just picking one. Like Obama, oh no, we can only do, only do healthcare. No, we can't do carbon tax. No, we can't do this, that, that. We can't do a bill against Citizens United. No, 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 we can't do that. No, that's too many, too much. No, they never do. They lost it all in 210. Everything, house and senate, because that's all they were working. You, you know, you have to realize you are working in a context where democracy is not fully functioning, because democracy requires a loyal opposition, and you don't have a loyal opposition. You have, let's face it, a treasonous opposition. No, they won't. They won't really join Trump now because they are confident they can overthrow you in two years, blame you and make you a one term and then back to something like Trump, but less incompetent than him. He was almost a blessing in that 
he was kind of the extreme cover blower for the lack of loyal opposition in that he was an executive who allied himself with all our enemies, the Confederacy, the Nazis, and the KGB. He allied himself and every dictator, North Korean and Chinese, that he could find. He pretended at the end to be against the Chinese because they didn't help his reelection. But he's not. He congratulated Xi Jinping for crushing the Uyghurs, flattering him. So those oligarchs are not going to get after a dictator because they want to be dictators themselves, like Trump showed. So take that lesson. Do not think that normalcy is happening. Normal democracy is where you have a loyal opposition who will help you govern when you're in the ascendancy, your party, your faction. They'll be conservative, but they will help you govern. But these people have not been doing that since Tom DeLay, since Gingrich, since McConnell, since McCarthy or whatever his name is, who wanted to join overthrowing the election. They joined the lawsuit to overthrow the election. Even before you take office, that's not a loyal opposition. Okay, okay, they'll get more practical, you say. But no, they are not more practical. They are, they are ready. Reagan was treasonous. Nixon was treasonous in getting elected by blocking the Geneva Peace Conference and ending the Vietnam War in 2007 and 8. Reagan was treasonous in blocking the return of the hostages by the Iranians in, selling them, in promising to sell them weapons against Iraq in 1980. Uh, they were treasonous against, you know, recently, and Trump has been openly treasonous, a hiddenly treasonous for W, starting an intifada and by cons you know, Cheney conspiring with the Israelis to start a new int intifada and block the peace plan of Clinton's in 1999. So they, are, they have not been a loyal opposition for a long time. They are not true Republicans in the party of Lincoln, not at all. They are treasonous, neo-fascist, the neoconservatives. And they showed that with their invasion of Iraq, which broke the UN really because that was based on not invading people who haven't attacked you. You know, that was based on only with the Security Council resolution, not this kind of unilateral might makes right in global politics, which then licensed, then licensed Putin to it, and then with the overthrow of Libya also, and it licensed Putin to attack Georgia, to attack um, uh, 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 more recently, Armenia, and then before that, and then to attack Ukraine. But that was the do doing of this non-loyal opposition. So it's not that you're go we're going to go extremist. It's not that some sort of, that's, ex that's not extreme leftism. That's practical democraticism by saying we must oppose this lack of loyal opposition. So therefore we must investigate the behavior of these people, not just turn the page as Obama wrongly said, without reading what's on the page about the treachery of Cheney and his ilk. You know, Roger Stone, who's still rolling and just got pardoned, he started back in Reagan's time. It's that whole kind of person who just try to enrich themselves with the government and want to be that dictators and tyrants and oligarchs who are ready to sacrifice the US of A for their own wealth and power. Bannon, these people, they are not people you can reach across the aisle to. And 
the list of the people who joined the lawsuits and there's still more to come. And that's making everybody really uncomfortable. Maybe they'll do something January 5th before your, your election is certified in the, in the House and the Senate. We're still nervous about that, aren't we all? They're still raising millions and millions to continue all kinds of spurious things. And the minute they are, the guys out of the White House say it doesn't, they, they don't succeed with that, they're going to be crippling you in every conceivable way that they can everywhere, short of armed, armed violence, because they're trying to get the military to do martial law and things, but the military, luckily, is too sensible. So far. So I'm saying be practical and show progressives that you're not being naive in this reaching across the aisle routine. Call Mitch, I just called up on dear Mitch. No, you, Mitch will not really honestly follow with you unless he sees that you have a little more backbone about it. You have some progressives ready to rock and you have ability to get them to rock. And, you know, find out progressives among billionaires who are ready to go with you. You have to do that. Don't be fooled. If you think you have power yet, you don't. You have the White House. You have a slim majority in the Senate and you have near. But I don't see you making even enough fuss about Georgia. But maybe I'm wrong. So this would be if you had native people, you have blacks, people, a special position for the Native Americans, special position for the black, special new cabinet position for the Latinx and all immigrants in the cabinet, that would show. And then they should seek to fund maybe from discretionary to fund these lobbying institutions that I'm saying should be there to lobby against big ag, big food, big oil, big internet on behalf of minorities in every bill and in the, in the, in the portfolio of every other, in the State Department, everything, everyone. They're there to keep their kind of energy up like the, the Native American would reinforce the Native American lady in interior who's going to run into all kind of opposition. But they'd reinforce how vital it is. And they'd, they would have the platform to your cabinet, you as executive would have the bully pulpit to go against these, these people who will obstruct what you try to do. You have to be Truman. You can't be Carter, Clinton, Obama. The good things they did, they were all good. But you can't be like them acting as if you had a loyal opposition when you don't. You will when the Republican, when you show force, when you show fire, when you show, you show insight and determination. And then the Republicans will split into the fanatics and to the ones who want to govern with you from a conservative point of view. But as long as the ones who signed up on those lawsuits and who wanted to show that they wanted to over, willing to overthrow the election, as long as they are the ones you're reaching across the aisle to, you're not going to get it true. You only get fake handshakes from them. You will not get, because they will be waiting to get rid of you, okay, to capture you, imprison you in the White House in 2022. And you will be losing the fire from the youth who want to go with the AOC and the squad and this kind of people. They want to, fund, to go with those people. And they won't believe in you when you're avoiding seeing the lack of loyal opposition by, by some notion of normalcy. Okay. You have to reach back to Lincoln's normalcy, not Andrew Johnson's normalcy. 
you have to reach back to Teddy Roosevelt's normalcy, to FDR's normalcy, nothing less. New New Deal, green, red, black, yellow, brown, yellow. That's the normalcy you need. Thank you. So, so anyway, this is, a, you know, I, I, should do, I should do podcasts on each of these ideas in more detail and be less disorganized than I am today because I'm really doing holiday greetings. And I don't know how long this was. And my engineer doesn't tell me, but it's long, probably long enough. And um, I'm going to do my next podcast is going to be with Kiri Westby. And it's going to be over her book, Fortune Favors the Brave, where she does something for feminism and it's internationally. And she chronicles her work with this group of people and in her now in her book. Not a novel. It's a dark, it's a true story, true bio story, and she's wonderful. And so I'm going to do one, somehow before New Year, with her. Okay. So dawning of the light, and here we go. Okay. All the best. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you join, and let's really go for it. Let's speak out. Let's let's be a, let's reach out. And embrace those who will repent from this whole game they've been playing of not being a loyal opposition and not allowing, therefore, the government to function to defend the people against ruthless oligarchic corporate power. There is good corporate power. Not all of them are bad. We shouldn't be anti-wealth. We're not anti-billionaire. We love them. We need their help. We need to see a division among them. We need the good ones to help us because they can make decisions quickly and they can help. We need them. We're not anti them. We shouldn't frighten them. We shouldn't speak, that's, that's you know, Bernie and socialism. We don't need, we don't need to use that term in this, in this anti-rich way. We need the help of the rich as well as the poor, as well as the fading median, middle. <laughs> okay, let's be clear about that from right away. Okay, all the best. Bye. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Men Love membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House Men Love membership, please visit our websites at tibethouse.us and menla.org.